Imagine that at the beginning of the 24th century, humanity set its course for the stars. The reason was ecological and climate disasters that for the last three centuries had depleted our planet, turning it into a place unsuitable for life. The rapid melting of ice caused sea levels to rise, erasing entire cities and coastal settlements from the face of the earth. Massive deforestation led to destruction and impoverishment of ecological communities, resulting in the loss of lives of both humans and animals. However, people continued to use fossil resources as fuel, knowing that it leads to the poisoning of the environment and the gradual transformation of the world into a hostile environment for them. Meanwhile, a small part of humanity, unable to cope with the devastating consequences of this heavy legacy, turned their gaze to the stars in search of new life. But where? What were the chances of finding an Earth-like planet that could accept and protect them from the ruins that people had once created themselves? Powerful telescopes were built, and very quickly, hundreds of Earth-twin planets were discovered orbiting distant stars. In the end, our home was not as unique as we thought. The universe turned out to be full of worlds similar to our Earth. Imagine hundreds of spacecraft, comparable in size to ancient transatlantic ships, leaving Earth. Some headed to the Alpha Centauri system, while others ventured further to more distant stars. Despite the use of the most modern engines, this journey would take centuries, and perhaps only the descendants of the travelers would see the distant planet with their own eyes. During this time, the descendants of those who remained on Earth realizing the critical situation and the destructiveness of their behavior, might finally be able to fix everything and cleanse the planet, or... Really? Do you truly believe that one day we will leave Earth and all its problems behind? That we will be able to travel across the galaxy, colonizing planets and unfolding trade? Perhaps. But I must disappoint you. Without changing our worldview, our attitude towards ourselves, each other, and the environment we inhabit, it is unlikely that humanity will survive in those ships. It would be a closed system, which is also millions of times smaller than planet Earth, meaning destruction would come much faster. It turns out that there is no point in leaving not only the solar system, but also our home planet. So why should we colonize the solar system? We can assert that humanity's motivation for colonizing interstellar space is determined by three important goals. Scientific research, resource acquisition, and the search for new habitable worlds. The first point certainly requires our attention. Scientific research will be carried out wherever we are, always and everywhere. The need to understand the world and the environment is a need of every person, regardless of their level of awareness. And this fact is the most explainable in our activities in space. Increasingly smart probe robots come to the aid of inquisitive minds, Robots that can work, exploring planets and space objects, without risking human life and health, and without the need for their presence. The second point in the list is refuted by the fact that there is no need to leave our solar system, at least in the near future. We possess a sufficient amount of resources that don't require a long journey. It's enough to explore the Moon, asteroids, and Mars to utilize their gifts. As for the search for new habitable worlds for humans, this doesn't necessarily have to wait until the planet is overpopulated. Endless wars and ecological disasters prevent mankind from turning their gaze to uninhabited parts of our planet, which require incomparably less expenditure to develop than building spacecraft and millennia of travel. However, many scientists and proponents of space migration, from Stephen Hawking and Robert Zubrin to Elon Musk, have emphasized that interplanetary resettlement is the only long-term protection against extinction. Whether it's anthropogenic reasons, climate change, nuclear war, etc., or due to an asteroid impact, gamma ray burst, or some other cosmic phenomenon, being in one place makes human civilization vulnerable. Of course, it's good to have a Plan B planet at our disposal for protection from a cosmic threat. But it should be understood that not all inhabitants of Earth would be transported to a hypothetical new planet. It would only be a way to save, let's say, a thousand people giving our species a chance to avoid extinction, 
but it definitely wouldn't be the salvation of everyone. Unfortunately, we must abandon the idea that Earth's overpopulation problem can be solved simply by mass migration. To reject this possibility, it's enough to consider that the Earth's population is currently increasing by about 80 million people each year. This means that if we wanted to maintain the current number of inhabitants, we would have to transport 80 million people to Mars or the Moon every year. An absolutely unattainable task, even with far more advanced technology than ours. So, let's imagine that humanity does decide to leave the solar system and reach one of the nearest stars. How would this happen? Let's assume that we're talking about sending a group of people on a research expedition, not mechanical probes. Obviously, spaceships capable of accommodating dozens, perhaps even hundreds of people, would be required. And this alone would not be an easy task. And on what resources would the engines of these ships operate? As is well known, the main problem in space exploration is the vast distance between stars and the impossibility of exceeding the speed of light. With current technology, it would take thousands of years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Even if we could reach the speed of light, the journey would take years. This means that at the maximum speed in the universe, the speed of light, humanity would only be able to explore the vicinity of our sun and certainly could not establish a network of routes throughout the galaxy. Suppose scientists have discovered a planet with optimal conditions for human life. Let's consider all possible options for resettling volunteers on this planet. As mentioned, the journey could extend over many centuries. Thus, it's necessary to create ships that could accommodate not everyone, but the maximum necessary variety of living beings, including humans. These would need to be enormous spacecraft, aboard which multiple generations of people and animals could coexist. Additionally, for the survival of even a small number of species, self-sufficient natural ecosystems must thrive. Without delving too deeply into the problems of sustaining the life of all the inhabitants of the ship, let's highlight just the three most important ones. The first is the need for population control of all living beings, including humans, during the long journey. The second is that the ship, as a mechanical system, has a tendency to break down. Parts wear out, meaning there must be huge warehouses with spare parts or factories for their manufacture on board. The third is the source of propulsive energy. No form of energy known to humanity is suitable for such prolonged movement of the ship, not even nuclear. Overall, we have no advantages here. Let's think about the planet, the fortunate candidate for our resettlement. If the planet is habitable, it is likely already populated by various forms of plant and animal life and filled with ecosystems formed by millions of years of evolution. There might even be an advanced civilization with intelligent beings who are likely to differ from us not so much in appearance as in the level of thought. A simple example is our animals. They too have intelligence, their own albeit primitive consciousness, which by the way allows them to survive where a rational human under the same conditions would have long since lost the ability to do so. And if the consciousness of the natives of the new planet turns out to be higher than ours, we won't even realize it immediately. A small child, up to three years old, also believes that they are the most important, the smartest in the world, and that everything around them exists only for their well-being and safety. However, a child begins their first developmental crisis related to their consciousness around the age of three. And here we are talking about the collision of two civilizations. Consider the ethical side of the resettlement issue and the ever-present human factor. The first generation would consist of volunteers subsequent ones of compelled settlers. An alternative method could involve cryo-chambers with crew members or a biobank with embryos, which upon reaching the destination would be grown by artificial intelligence education programs. Imagine nursery groups with thousands of children without a single adult. That's a bleak prospect. Suppose the new planet does not have a civilization in the way we understand it. This slightly simplifies the task. 
but our ecosystems might be incompatible, leading to the extinction of either the local life forms or the newcomers, which again would end in ecological disasters and nullify all the centuries of effort spent on resettlement. Current technologies still do not allow us to determine in advance which planets, detected by telescopes, are suitable for life. Embarking on a long space journey without thorough planning and without a comprehensive study of the destination would be unjustifiably risky and simply impossible. Take, for example, our planet Mars. There are riverbeds, frozen water beneath the surface, methane emissions, remnants of organic compounds. These are signs of possible life on the planet, but scientists have not yet discovered developing life there. Even if we solved the shipbuilding problems, who would want to go there to escape Earth's cataclysms? So let's assume the planet of our interest, with all conveniences, eagerly awaits the arrival of humans and is located 50 light years from us. Telescopes alone will not be sufficient for its exploration. Suppose that in 2100, scientists were finally able to create reconnaissance probes capable of withstanding all the vicissitudes of open space. These devices would be sent to the new planet that same year. How many years would it take for the probe to land on Earth too? If the planet is 50 light years away from Earth and the exploratory probe travels at 10% of the speed of light, it would take approximately 500 years to reach this planet. 10% of the speed of light is about 30,000 kilometers per second. Currently, there are no devices capable of achieving such speed. The highest speed achieved by terrestrial devices was by the Parker Solar Probe. Its maximum limit was about 700,000 kilometers per hour, which equals approximately 200 kilometers per second, far from 30,000. This is enough to understand that resettling on another planet to prevent humanity's demise due to Earth's destructions is not a feasible option. It's better to invest resources and efforts in technologies that preserve and restore the environment, or even better, to change our stereotypes. Well, what about the time dilation effect then, you might ask? As an object approaches the speed of light, time dilation relative to a stationary observer is observed. This phenomenon, known as time dilation, was detailed in Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. As the speed of a spaceship increases, time for its passengers starts to pass more slowly relative to time on Earth. Imagine a spaceship traveling at 95% of the speed of light to a planet 9.5 light years away. For a stationary observer on Earth, the journey would take 10 years. However, for the crew members of the spaceship, the time spent in transit is perceived quite differently. It seems to them that they have spent only about 3.12 years on the journey. This means that between the time of departure from Earth and reaching the destination, the crew members aged only a little more than three years, while a whole 10 years passed on Earth. Go, go, go. Seven years per hour here. Let's make it count. It's interesting to note that at speeds approaching 99% of the speed of light, time on board the ship begins to pass seven times slower, and at speeds of 99.99% of the speed of light, 70 times slower. That is, the closer the ship gets to the speed of light, the slower time is perceived on board. Theoretically, if the ship reaches the speed of light, time for the passengers would stop. These optimistic expectations about the possibility of freely moving across the galaxy indeed open an impressive perspective. They suggest that for an observer moving in a spaceship at a speed close to 100% of the speed of light, the journey to any point in the galaxy becomes virtually instantaneous. Whether it's a distance of 100 or 100,000 light years, this discovery gives us an idea of how we could freely and easily move from one point in the galaxy to another. In reality, the time effect does not solve all problems. As noted earlier, reaching a speed close to the speed of light requires a tremendous amount of energy, which ultimately might be practically infinite. None of the existing forms of propulsion can provide such a level of energy. Even if the energy problem were miraculously solved, there still remains the fact that a spacecraft moving at speeds close to the speed of light finds itself in an extremely dangerous position. And here's why. 
The vacuum of space is a complex environment containing various chemical elements, mineral particles, etc. For example, hydrogen atoms predominate in intergalactic space. The probability of two atoms colliding in a cubic centimeter of space is one thing. However, at speeds close to the speed of light, harmless particles turn into a dangerous stream with high penetrating power, which can seriously damage the hull of the spacecraft, posing a deadly risk to any form of life on board. Passing through a thin, misty cloud could lead to the complete destruction of the spacecraft. So, any spacecraft daring to venture into the realm of Einsteinian relativity would essentially become a world unto itself, with a past full of hopes, a present confined to three minutes, and an uncertain future. Such an endeavor would raise profound questions about its usefulness. In general, there's no point in thinking about it. At present and in the near future, the technical capabilities to make a giant leap to the stars just don't exist. In conclusion, we come to the realization that humans will never leave the confines of our solar system. All these reasons, scientific research, resource acquisition, the search for new habitable worlds, will remain in our dreams. If we truly want to find answers to questions and solve our problems, we need to look inward, not to the stars. And that's all from me. If you like this video, don't forget to rate it. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. Your engagement is the best reward for me. Thank you for your attention. See you soon. Bye.